It was a weekend that changed the world. A weekend that started shrouded in darkness and a weekend that ended in the rising light of the dawn. What weekend am I speaking about? The weekend our Lord Jesus was betrayed, denied and killed, which was the very same weekend he rose from the dead. The darkness and the dawn is where I'd like us to park a little while this morning. I want to invite you to return with me to those days when our Lord walked into the awful darkness only to rise into the sunlight dawn of triumph in order to save all of his people from their sins. The darkness and the dawn. And effectively, they're the two things I'd like us to see in our Bibles this morning as we scan a few passages in the Gospels but spend perhaps most of our time in Luke's Gospel. Firstly, the darkness. There's a sense in which when Jesus came into this world, he came to a world of darkness, though he himself came as the light of the world. You think about it. At Bethlehem, when the Saviour was born, the night was temporarily changed into day as the glory of the Lord shone around the shepherds. That unusual star gave a peculiar light in the midst of the night as the morning star was given to this dark world. When Matthew describes the beginning of the Lord's ministry in Galilee, he quotes from the book of Isaiah, and in chapter 4 of Matthew, quoting from Isaiah, he says, The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. The people in that region, sitting in darkness, saw a great light, the light of the world. For the light of men had dawned. And yet, as we think of our Lord's earthly ministry, his life, surely that brief life, as we think of that man, the Lord Jesus, the God-man walking through this dark world, it was the time at the end of his life, above all others, that he walked into that awful, thick darkness. I'm speaking about the last 24 hours, if you like, roughly, of his life. Come with me then as we think of the four aspects that perhaps we can see of the darkness. Firstly, as we think of this last period in our Lord's life, the upper room, darkness. It's Thursday night. Jesus has gathered the 12 disciples together in order to celebrate the Passover and among the number was, of course, Judas Iscariot. Only two days prior to this, the chief priests and scribes had gathered together with the high priest in order to plan how they would kill Jesus. And it was into that gathering that Judas had come. If you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 22, and we'll follow through something of the story as we unfold these things. Luke chapter 22 We read the first couple of verses. Now the feast of the unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. Verse 2. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Here we see the sickening betraying darkness, we might call it, beginning to fall over this whole scene, two days out, the Tuesday, perhaps the Tuesday evening. And you'll notice there in verse 3 that the devil, that is the prince of the demons of darkness, was intimately involved in this process. Verse 4 goes on to say, so he, that is Judas, went his way. His way, not the way of truth. He went the way of deception and murder. And we know as the story unfolds that the religious leaders not only agreed to give him money, but it seems when we look at Matthew's account that they actually counted out the money for Judas or the pieces of silver, perhaps coins 
of silver. In verse 6 it says in Luke 22, so he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So with the 30 silver coins or the 30 pieces of silver maybe in his pocket, Judas went looking for the best occasion for his plan to be successful. The next paragraph in this chapter describes Jesus giving directions to Peter and John to go and prepare the upper room for the Passover. We just duck over to the Gospel of John and chapter 13, we have much more information between chapter 13 and, and right through to chapter 17 of what actually unfolded, what Jesus did, what Jesus said in the upper room in that very season that we're thinking about. In John 13, we read in verse 2, and supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Let's just very briefly think of that scene. Jesus knew that Judas had already agreed to betray him. Jesus knew that somewhere Judas has stashed that 30 pieces of silver or those 30 coins. Jesus knew this. And yet though Jesus knew that, Jesus moves around that upper room and he washes their feet, even Judas' feet. And then the upper room darkness thickens, if you will. It thickens when we hear Jesus' words in verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you, I know whom I have chosen, that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. Verse 26, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, that is to Judas, What you do, do quickly. Satan came to that upper room. Satan stirred up Judas's evil heart. Satan entered Judas. Judas and Satan in collusion to kill Jesus. Satan knew. Judas knew. Jesus knew. But no one else in that room knew. That's what the passage teaches, verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the far feast. Or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately and it was night. What a graphic touch John adds to conclude that scene there, the end of verse 30, when he says, and it was night. You see, Judas left the upper room to go into the dark night to arrange his deed of darkness, the betrayal of the master, who, remember, was one of his friends. We see then firstly the upper room darkness. Let's move now secondly as the story unfolds to think about the silent garden darkness and just follow over in John's Gospel to chapter 18. We then read in John 18 verse 1 when Jesus had spoken these words, that's all the words recorded from verse chapter 13 right through to chapter 17. He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So if you've got the picture, if you've got the, the scene, 
in your own mind what's actually happening. Jesus left the upper room. That's in Jerusalem. It's a room, it's a house somewhere in Jerusalem with a room upstairs. No doubt, perhaps, they walked down those steps which could have been steps on the outside of the building. They walk through the streets of Jerusalem and they go out the city gate that's closest towards the Garden of Gethsemane. They go out the city gate, they go down across the brook Kidron and they begin to walk up the hillside on the opposite side to where the city was and they enter the Garden of Gethsemane in order to pray. Jesus had done this numerous occasions before. But the prayers on this night were far more intense than ever before. He agonised in prayer. The drops of blood fell from his brow as he wrestled with God and as it were it seems even possible that he's surrounded by the hosts of darkness in this season of great darkness in his life. Verse 3 then says, as the story continues, then Judas having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches and weapons. Notice what they're carrying. They're carrying lanterns and torches. Of course they need them because remember, it's dark. It's night. And here comes Judas under the cover of darkness to fulfill his devilish plan and to betray his Lord with a kiss. They've been in that garden praying Some of them, as we know, have been sleeping. So that garden has been a quiet setting. And now the silence of the garden was broken by the clanging of the swords and the lanterns in the darkness. How true those words of the Lord Jesus were that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And Judas came to do his evil deed, a deed of darkness, and he came under the cover of darkness. Judas kissed Jesus. Enough light there from those lanterns to send the message as that's what it was. It was the cue signalling to those with him that this was the man to arrest. This was the man now to take away. And then Luke records some of the words that Jesus said to the religious leaders present. So I invite you to come back to Luke's Gospel now, to Luke chapter 22. The words that Jesus said says he addresses these words not to Judas but he addresses them to the religious leaders there. It says in verse 52 of Luke 22 he's speaking to chief priests, the captains of the temple and the elders. If you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs. Then he says in 53, when I was with you daily in the temple you did not try to seize me. And here Jesus exposes their shallow piety. He exposes their thin layer of religion. Jesus exposes their deed of darkness. He effectively says, "Um, why didn't you arrest me earlier this week? I was in the temple every day earlier this week. Why didn't you arrest me then? Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest their deeds should be exposed. Then Jesus says some very revealing words, still in verse 53. He says, but, he knows the reason why they didn't arrest him. It wasn't your hour. He says, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. This is the hour you've been longing for. Yet you are men, mere men. And you are tools in the hands of another. This is one who is the the prince of darkness. You're being empowered by the prince of the power of the air. This is your hour. This is the power of darkness. Jesus shows us that in the silent garden, Where he went to pray, the power of darkness is at work. And yet there's a third area that I want to draw your attention to when it comes to the darkness in the process of the last hours of Jesus' life and that is the early morning darkness. You think of the horrible deeds of darkness that then unfolded with our Lord throughout the early hours of the Friday morning. 
in the wee hours of that morning, in the high priest's courtyard, there's a fire that's flickering in the darkness. Verse 55 says, Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. It's around that flickering fire that Peter denies his Lord. Verse 60, part of what it says in this passage. Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter, with all of his shame, runs off into the darkness to weep with bitterness. Think then of the darkness that Jesus endured as still the process unfolds, the darkness connected with the mocked trial, the beating, the ridicule from the Roman soldiers, the horrible treatment that the God of all gods, that the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, the only potentate we heard of before, how he had to endure all that horrible treatment in the hands of cynical and hard-hearted men. He's tossed from pillar to post. Before the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin hand him over to Pilate. Pilate has him for a while. Pilate sends him off to Herod when he can think he can get rid of him. Herod does his stuff to him, treats him cruelly. Herod then sends him back to Pilate. All of this in the early hours of the morning. And then with Pilate, the great miscarriage of justice under his hand. Pilate, remember, crumbling under the political pressure of the heat of that moment. The whipped up crowd calling for a darkened criminal to be released in the place of he who was the only sinless man that this world has ever seen. And then, who can ever fathom the depth of excruciating pain that Jesus had to endure that morning? The physical suffering experienced by the Roman scourge perhaps him stumbling under the weight of his own cross, perhaps on the verge of blacking out such pain as he walks down the Via Dolorosa. His screams of agony when the soldiers drove the nails through his wrists and feet. Let's remember, friends, that Jesus walked deliberately and directly into this awful, thick, darkness and he did it out of love for you and me and yet we have not yet seen Jesus enter the worst and the blackest darkness and that is fourthly the midday darkness we turn over to Luke chapter 23 as Jesus is on the cross he's being there for Three hours. In Luke 23, we read in verse 44. Now, it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole, over all the earth, until the ninth hour. The sixth hour being, in our language, midday, 12 noon. So at midday, for three hours, darkness covers Calvary. But of course this darkness doesn't just cover Calvary, not just the, that, that area outside the city of Jerusalem. It covers the entire city of Jerusalem. So Pilate experienced this, Herod experienced this, all the people that lived in Jerusalem experienced this. It covers the whole land. It possibly covers the whole world. And then at the end, remember we know this, the end of those three eerie hours of darkness, Jesus cries out those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, of all the darkness that Jesus experienced, the things that we've briefly considered, that is the upper room darkness, the silent garden darkness, 
the early morning darkness, of all of that darkness that Jesus experienced, it was the midday darkness that was the darkest of all the dark. For never before in eternity past, never ever before, had the Son been out of fellowship with his Father. Never had the triune God been separated. But now Jesus, the God-man, had sin laid upon him. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Habakkuk tells us you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and you cannot look on wickedness. In those eerie hours of darkness, God the Father turns away from his Son due to the sin that he was bearing. Not his sin, but the sin, every sin of all of those who would believe in him. You know that outward darkness that all the people saw and experienced and you imagine the havoc that that created? That outward darkness though, was it was a sign. It was a symbol, it was a clear sign of the deep inner darkness that Jesus was experiencing. For the darkness displayed the judgment of God. What was happening at Calvary? We often think cross and love. Well, that's true. But we only can understand cross and love when we think of Calvary, when we really understand what all that was happening, and that is that God's wrath was being poured out upon the sin bearer. That's what makes it such great love. So that those that Jesus died for might no longer have to bear the divine consequence of their sins. I think it's, it's right to say that there's a very real sense that hell came to Calvary. That hell came to Calvary that Friday, that the Saviour, as it were, there on the cross, descended into or bore the horror of hell. For what is hell? It's, it's the place of God's wrath. Righteous justice. What, why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus endure that? Well, Paul tells us, he loved me and gave himself for me. In Luke chapter 23, we read in verse 46, and when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. You think what darkness must have then risen in the hearts of those who had faith who were around that cross. We know that there were women there. You think of the darkness that, as it were, began to rise in the hearts of the disciples when the news spreads. The darkness of despair that spread through all the followers. The master is dead. He's gone. All oh, the darkness was real that weekend. But that's not how the weekend finished. In the second place, think with me about the dawn. And I want you to turn now to Matthew's account into Matthew chapter 28 and we'll just park in this passage as the narrative of the resurrection. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Let's delight in this scene, friends. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Did you notice the reference there to dawn? As the first day of the week began to dawn. 
into the darkness burst the dawn. True daylight began to appear. On this first Lord's Day morning, we find the dawn that a sin-sick, dark world desperately needed. This was a morning of joy and gladness. This was a morning, as we know, that opened up a new and a living way. Let's read the narrative, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. Oh, the brightness of that moment. It's dawn. It's not yet fully light. And there's that angel sitting on the stone. He's shining brightly. It's like the angel's glowing on that dawn. Where's the stone? The stone has been rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, but it wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. It's not as if Jesus was in the inside knocking on the door. Someone opened the door. The stone was rolled away to show that Jesus was already out. Verse 4, And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Oh, a message of light that morning. You hear the message of that dawn? He is not here. He is risen. Go and have a look yourself. And surely that caused faith in its initial embers to begin to dawn in their hearts. Matthew tells us in verse 8 how they left quickly. They ran to spread the news. What news they had to share. It was the good news that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead and that of course was the news that would cause spiritual darkness to flee. And we know, don't we, from reading the book of Acts that that was the message that the apostles continued to preach all their days. Not just that the Saviour died for sinners, but that he rose again for sinners. The resurrection was a theme of the apostles' preaching. Well, let's think about then that empty tomb, our Lord's empty tomb. Surely it's the dawning of hope for mankind. It's a revelation of real spiritual light for us. It tells us three things. Surely it tells us what Christ conquered. It tells us who Christ is. It tells us what Christ has accomplished. Let's think of three things. Firstly, it's a declaration of his victory. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul says this about Jesus and the resurrection. He says, Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Jesus is the great prince of life. And he came to that door of death, a door that we could say that was sealed, closed since Adam's sin. But not even the rusty old hinges on that door of death could stop the Prince of Life. We know that the Roman seal on that stone couldn't stop the Prince of Life. It was the power of Christ that flung open the rusty hinges of the door of death. Death was conquered. The empty tomb declares that Jesus defeated death. Death is swallowed up in victory, Paul says. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the only hope for you and me to face and overcome death is by having personal faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ. Paul didn't say, well, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our good works. 
No, he said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Put your hope in your good works and you will fail. Put your hope in Christ and you will triumph. It is appointed for every one of us that we ourselves will experience death. Now, that's a not uh, a nice subject to talk about. It's not a popular subject to talk about and we don't like to think about it, do we? Death. That is our death, my death, your death. We try and push it out of our minds. We try and avoid it as best we can. We try and push it away from us. We want to avoid it. But we will never escape our own death. You see what a wonderful truth dawns in our hearts in light of this empty tomb? If we have saving faith in Jesus, the open, empty tomb of Christ is not only a declaration of his victory, it's a declaration of our victory. Because he rose from the dead. If we are united to him by faith, we too shall have victory over death. How are you going to face death, your death? What's your hope? of overcoming that fear. Well, it can't be you. It can't be your deeds and your good things. That's a vain hope. But it can be Jesus. It can only be Jesus. So as we face, as Christians, as we face our own inevitable death, surely we can have this truth dawning in our hearts. The stones rolled away. We can go, as it were, and look inside. He's not there. Yes, dark and gloomy death can be overcome through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. The resurrection of Christ is the dawning of hope for you and me as each of us will face death. So it's not only a declaration of his victory, but secondly, let me suggest, as we think of the dawn, as we think of the empty tomb, as we think of the open tomb, it's a manifestation of his person. For three long years, Jesus declared that he was God in the flesh. And we know the story. Almost everywhere he went, people would not believe him. Oh no, you're just a man. You're just Joseph's son. You're just Mary's son. You're just a carpenter. And of course he did miracles and they could not deny those miracles. So rather than deny the miracles, they deny the source of the power. You're not God. Actually, you're working for Satan. That's where you get your power. He foretold that he would be killed and that on the third day he would rise from the dead. And when he did actually rise from the dead, it was a manifestation to the world that he was the Son of God. In Romans chapter 1, Paul says this in the opening paragraph. Romans 1 verse 3 and 4 concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So he's saying Jesus was a real man. He had flesh. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The empty tomb was a manifestation of his person. It was a declaration that he's the Son of God. And Peter knew that. Well, at least he knew it later. <laughs> and Peter could stand up oh, roughly, what, 48, 47 days later on the day of Pentecost and he could say in his preaching, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and and Christ. That empty tomb on that Sunday morning was a declaration of his person. He actually was who he said he was. And that's a truth that needs to dawn in our hearts for the simple reason that every one of us will stand before this living Christ. Yes, it's appointed unto men to die. And after this, the judgment. 
We can't avoid death. We can't avoid the fact that we will stand before the living Christ. You can try and push that out of your mind. You can try and ignore my words. You can try and distract yourself right now and think about anything else but what you are now hearing but does not change the fact that you will stand before this living Christ. The empty tomb is a manifestation of his person. Thirdly and finally, what else do we see in the empty tomb? What else does it teach us? What else do we understand? Well, a satisfaction of his justice. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. He says, if Christ is still dead, then you're still in your sins. Your faith is vain. Your hope is hopeless. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead, therefore, causes tremendous hope to dawn in our hearts if we believe. If we don't believe, well, then it's just like, well, we're still in the dark. There's no dawn. And if he did not rise from the dead, we have no hope and we are still in our sins and we still stand under the judgment of God. But the radiant gospel light that burst from the empty tomb was that Jesus actually satisfied God's justice. He had successfully completed the task of what ultimately he had come to do. As we've said before, he had a mission to do. And at the end of his time, he could say, mission accomplished. Why was he given? Well, the angel tells us in Matthew 1.21, he will save his people from their sins. And at the end of the mission, it's been accomplished. Saving his people from their sins. Paul says again in Romans chapter 4, In verse 25, Jesus our Lord was raised because of our justification. You say, what does all that mean? (laughs) Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on account of us being declared righteous. In other words, the empty tomb shows that Jesus' atoning death for sinners was accepted by God. His sacrifice was accepted by the Father. Divine justice was satisfied and therefore we could put it this way, his resurrection was a validation that those who place their trust in Jesus Christ will be declared righteous by God. Let me say that just one other way to make it clear. Those who trust in Jesus not only have had their sins laid upon Jesus, but his righteousness is laid upon them so that if God looks at them, they're declared righteous in the court of heaven, justified by faith alone in Christ alone. You see, this has got nothing to do with doing good deeds and being a good person to get our way into heaven. Absolutely nothing to do with that. It's all about Christ and what he has done on behalf of sinners. What we would never dare to do and what we would never be able to do, he has done for us. And yet if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, none of us would have hope and we would always be in our sins. There are many today who are still in their sins. And maybe that's you. I'm persuaded that it's some of you still under the judgment of God hangs over you like a dark threatening cloud. Of course you're in the darkness and you don't even realise it's there but it's there. If you would only but trust in Jesus Christ The glorious light of the gospel will dawn in your heart. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll receive the righteousness of Christ. In the language of Peter, oh, that the day would dawn and the morning star arise in your heart.
Are you still walking in spiritual darkness? There you are at home, playing your games, riding your bike, on the computer, clicking on the mouse, in spiritual darkness. Fulfilling the deeds of darkness. That's the teaching of the Bible. Headed for an eternity of outer darkness. I'm describing some of you. But the good news is if you would turn from your sins and trust in Jesus, you'll be delivered from the power of darkness, you'll be given the Holy Spirit and that means that he will then work through you and enable you to walk as children of light. Jesus calls you today, whether you are a young child, a teenager, an adolescent or an adult, he calls you to come out of the darkness and come into his marvellous light. What a weekend that was. It changed the world. And my friend, that weekend can change your world this weekend. The darkness and the dawn. Christian friends, as we conclude, let us bask this morning in the sunshine of the resurrection dawn. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. May God help us as his people as we come to his table to come with a fresh appreciation of what he did for us. He endured the darkness for us so that we might experience the dawn of grace in our lives. Sins forgiven, gift of the Holy Spirit, declared righteous in God's holy presence. And of course, waiting for the day when we shall go to the place where there is no night, where there is no darkness at all. Revelation 22 describes heaven as a city where the glory of God forever is illuminated by him because the Lamb is the light. Oh, how can we not have a great appreciation for all that Christ has done for us as his people. Once in darkness, but now by his grace, called out of that, translated into the kingdom of light. May our Lord get all the glory this very weekend. I invite you to bow with me as we briefly pray.